All right, so I want to continue on with uh, the set theory section with uh, talking a little bit about some definitions uh, aside from the set operations. So before the, uh, before the end of the last video, we set up some uh, set operations like, uh, like union and intersection and symmetric difference and uh, the difference, the set difference uh, between the two sets. And now we want to talk a little bit more about some definitions that we can have upon sets. So specifically, I want to talk about two theorems here. So theorem two and theorem three. Uh, but before we talk about those, let's just define this thing called disjointness of two sets. So when we have two sets A and B, okay, they are called disjoint if the intersection is equal to the empty set. So if the intersection is empty, we call this disjointness of two sets. So in essence, uh, A and B is disjoint. Um, looks something like this on the Venn diagram. So we have, we have like set A and we have a set B that kind of looks like this. So meaning that their intersection is empty. They have nothing in common. Now, uh, there is a theorem that says if uh, theorem two here, if A and B are sets in a universe, then A and B are disjoint if and only if A union B is equal to A symmetric difference B. So the union is equal to the exclusive or uh, of the two sets. So here we're going to uh, go back to our alternative definition of the uh, symmetric difference. And we're going to say A symmetric difference B. So we'll call this 524. Um, A symmetric difference B is equal to, we'll say A union B minus uh, a intersect B. So if you take a look back at our previous video, we defined this as an alternate definition. Uh, they are in fact equal. So uh, later on we'll t in the section, we'll talk about how to show that uh, two sets are actually equal to each other. Uh, but if we take a look at the, the expression here and we assume a case where A and B are disjoint. So when A and B are disjoint, the definition is that the intersection is equal to empty. So we can just substitute this directly into our equation. We have A symmetric difference B is equal to A union B minus. Uh, now, since this is uh, empty, we can substitute an empty directly into the intersection. Uh, now, just as a side note, uh, when we were describing the set subtraction, the set difference between two sets, um, if I ever take a set A and I subtract an empty, right, uh, this is always going to be equal to A. So take everything in A that is not in the empty, it's just A, right? Uh, similarly, if we had take everything in A and subtract everything from A, then we would get the empty set. I hope that's intuitive. Uh, there's a third one where you can say empty set minus A. So start with empty, subtract off anything that crosses over to A while you're still left with empty. Okay, so just verify these properties of the set subtraction. And what we can use is that A is, uh, the, the uh, symmetric difference of A and B is equal to the union of A and B. So when A and B are disjoint, we see that we have this uh, equality. Now, another way that you can think about this theorem is uh, if you remember way back when we talked about the sum rule for counting, uh, we said that one of the assumptions we needed to make was that these two sets are disjoint or uh, the, the two tasks that we're doing are mutually exclusive or disjoint from each other. So they cannot be done together. So in that case, we can claim that when we do an or, it's like any type of or, right? So we just add the two together. Now later on in this section, we're going to uh, talk about what, uh, uh, what, what should we do when uh, it's not the case, right? So when these two sets are not disjoint, then how do we treat those sets or how should we think about these sets? But for now, just take this theorem too as just a theorem. All right, there's also a theorem three, which is in your textbook. Uh, if A and B are sets in a given, in a universe U, then the following are equivalent statements. Okay, so uh, equivalent, uh, 
than uh, the following are equivalent statements. Now we want to show that A, B, C, and D are all logically equivalent. Sorry, by the way, I should probably point out that 3.18 in your textbook, it really depends which textbook you are using. This textbook is referring to the Grimaldi textbook. Uh, so just, just take that as the, uh, into account in these notes here. Um, so when uh, in uh, theorem three, if we want to prove that statement A, statement B, statement C, and statement D are all logically equal statements, uh, then in theory, what we have to do is show that A is logically equal to B and that A is logically equal to C and that A is logically equal to D and and then we also need to show that B is logically equal to C and, and so on, right? So you can see we have, a, we have a string of things we need to show. And in fact, what the logically equal means is that we know that A by conditional B, which in turn means that A implies B and B implies A. So in essence, if we were to use the proof strategies that we've been using up to this point, we would need to show that A implies B and B implies A. We would also need to show that A implies C and C implies A and so on. So in short, we need to show that everything implies everything. In order for us to make a proper proof that all these statements are logically equal, we need to show that all of these statements A through D all imply each other. Now, the short answer to this is that we don't need to make all of these proofs. I know there's a lot of implies here, uh, but in short, we only need to make four proofs. The four proofs are that we need to prove that A implies B, we need to prove B implies C, C implies D, and finally D implies A. Now, if I am able to prove these four things, then through syllogism, now remember what syllogism is, I can show that anything implies anything. So for example, if I want to show that B implies D, right? So I know B implies C, C implies D, so therefore B implies D, right? Again, if I want to show that B implies A, if these four things are true, I can simply say that B implies C, C implies D, and D implies A, and through syllogism, B will imply A. So again, these are the really the only four things I need to prove here. So in essence, what I need to do is start from the very beginning. So let's assume that the statement A is true. Now I'm gonna go through a sequence of proofs here, sequence of steps, which are all true, ending with the same statement. So all of these statements are gonna be one directional statements. I'm not gonna show the opposite direction although the opposite directions may be true, but all of these arguments are going to be in one direction. All right, so when A is a subset of B, what can we say about a general Venn diagram of A and B? Well, let's take a look. We have the general Venn diagram, we have the set A, we have the set B. And if I take a look at this area right here, so this is the area that are the objects in A that are not in B. So again, I hope you remember uh, the definition from before that if I can even find one object that is in A and not in B, right away we can say A is not a subset of B. Okay, so if I can even find one object in A and not in B, then right away I can say A is not a subset of B. So what, what I can conclude is that this part is actually empty. So let's actually call it star. So I'm just gonna call this area star. I can say this implies that star is empty. Okay, so the area star in the Venn diagram is empty. And therefore this can imply that A union B. Now, if I take the union of A and B, so remember that uh, diagram that we drew about A and B, A union B is actually talking about the whole two circles, all of the, the elements that are in the two circles. This is nothing more than B. I hope you can see that in the diagram, right? So A union B is nothing more than B. This also implies from the fact that star is empty, this also implies that A intersect B is equal to A. Now this one is a little bit harder to see, but if you imagine where the intersection is, the intersection is the area in between, right? So the, 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 uh, the elements that are common to A and B. 
So the common area of A and B is equal to A because this star area is empty. So there's no, uh, there's no elements that are outside of B that belongs to A. So therefore the intersection of A and B is simply A. So these two things are, I think are trivial from the Venn diagram that we drew. And in fact, you can see that we've proven A implies B and B implies C right from, uh, right from that argument. All right, now let's move on. We want to show that C also implies D, or somehow I want to prove that all of this implies that the, the complement of B is a subset of the complement of A. So let's imagine that we have a element Z. Okay, let's imagine we have an element Z. So this element Z is in B complement. Okay, so let's imagine that this element is in B complement. What that really means is that Z is not in B. Okay, so when I say an element is in B complement, it really means that element is not in B. All right, what's next? Uh, Z, if Z is not in B, I can similarly say that Z is not in A intersect B. Okay, now why is that? So you need to think about, if I, if I show you that an element is not in the set B, then it must not be an A intersect B either because A intersect B is actually a smaller area, right? So if Z was somewhere outside of B, then surely it is outside of A intersect B, which is right here, okay? All right, well, so what is A intersect B? Well, it's nothing more than A. So this implies that Z is not in A. Okay, so that means that Z must be in a complement. Now, what did we just show? Well, we showed that if I imagine there's an object in B complement, then it must also be in A complement. Okay, now just take a second to uh, make sure you understand each step uh, that I took here. But basically what I've shown in this example or what we, in, this, uh, um, in this one step is that every element Z in B complement is also in A complement. So essentially what we have is some statement that says something like this, which is the exact definition that B complement is a subset of A complement. Okay, so I hope that's clear. We're now at step D. So, uh, so just one more, uh, one more point that uh, I want to make about this step here. I just want you to uh, be clear that the uh, opposite arrow is actually not true. If I say that Z is not an A, there's no guarantee that Z is not an A intersect B. Okay, so, so just, just know that this step doesn't go backwards. So that the arrows are actually going in one direction. All right, so so now where are we? So if I, if I, uh, if I change this uh, statement a little bit, I get something like for all Z, Z not in B implies Z is not in A. So really those two things are saying the same thing, right? So this is the same as saying that. And now if I take a contrapositive of this, so again, contrapositive means P implies Q, therefore, not Q implies not P. So I can say that this is logically equivalent to for all Z, Z in A implies Z in B. And what is this a definition of? It's a definition that A is a subset of B. So therefore, I can say that A is a subset of B. Now notice how this proof worked. I started with a statement a is a subset of B. I ended with the statement A is a subset of B. And then all, uh, all the intermediate steps, I had a one direction, one direction. So implies, 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 and so on. So what you can gather is that now through syllogism, everything implies everything. So what does this theorem actually tell us? Well, one thing it tells us is uh, a little bit about some properties, some characteristics uh, of the case when A is a subset of B. We can say that A union B is equal to B. So if I take the union of two sets, I actually get B, right? And 
And for that matter, whenever I see that the union of two sets is equal to one of the sets, there must be a subset uh, relationship there. Okay, similarly, when I take the intersection of two sets and I find the answer is one of the sets, there must be a uh, relationship there as well. So keep this in mind. This is what theorem three is telling me. Um, the other thing, if you take a look at uh, the A and the D, what uh, another, uh, another uh, characteristic of the subset relationship is that when I have A is a subset of B, the complement of B is a subset of the complement of A. Now just think about that for one second. Everything in the complement of B must be in the complement of A. Okay, so that is another uh, characteristic of a subset relationship uh, between A and B. Okay, but again, take away the, the strategy of uh, how we did this proof. Um, whenever we need to show that a bunch of statements are logically equivalent to each other, we need to make this kind of circular argument and everything implies everything. All right, so the next thing I want to uh, talk about is the laws of set theory. Now, if you just take a quick look at these laws, they sound a lot like the laws that we've used before. And in fact, they are. They're very similar to the laws that we've talked about before. Uh, there is one uh, law here, one law form that you probably haven't seen. But if you've been reading the textbook, you probably noticed that there is this thing called an absorption law. So I'll talk about the absorption law in one second. But just to let you know that these laws are very similar to the ones that we've seen from propositional logic. In fact, some of them have the exact same names. The idea is that whenever we see a negation in propositional logic, it's now a complement in set theory, which makes sense. Whenever we saw a or in propositional logic, now it's a union. Uh, whenever we saw an and, it's now an intersection, which also makes sense. And whenever we see a false, this is analogous to the empty set. And when we saw a true, this is analogous to the universe. So if you see like a a, a bold U, it's referring to the universe or everything, like the whole Venn diagram is the universe. Okay, so how do we verify these laws? So we can verify them actually in set theory through Venn diagrams. So, uh, so we're going to draw some more elaborate Venn diagrams in one second, but let's take a look at, uh, for example, the, um, let's see, this law, the Morgan's law. Okay, how do we verify De Morgan's law? So let's say, for example, I wanted to verify the left-hand side. Well, we can draw a Venn diagram for that. So I have this picture and with A and with B. And I wanna figure out what is the complement of A union B. So I'm gonna start with the left-hand side. What is the complement of A union B? Well, A union B is all of this here. The complement means that it is to the outside of it. So see if you agree that this is the complement of A union B. And then we want to show that this is equal to A uh, complement intersection B complement. So I want to I want to draw two diagrams here. So one for A complement and one for B complement. So A complement looks something like this. So we have the complement of A, okay? And then I also have the complement of B, which looks like this. You can kind of imagine where that goes, right? It is the opposite of B. And if I take the intersection, it should be equal to the left-hand side. Right, so just we need to verify that when we take the intersection, the, the area that is common to both diagrams, that we in fact get that. Okay, so this is one way to verify that, uh, that these are actually equal. So this is the union, and this is A complement, B complement, and then I take the intersection of the two, and I need to verify that they actually represent the same area. So this is how we verify the law. Let's do one more. Let's actually go down to absorption. Uh, the absorption law is that whenever we have a variable A and we take the union or the intersect of A intersect B or vice versa, as long as these two operations are the opposite of each other, then we can absorb the other variable, in this case, B. So A union A intersect B is equal to A. 
Now, how do we verify this? Well, again, we can draw a Venn diagram. So, so this one's a little bit harder, but it does involve two sets. So we have set A and set B, goes like this. Um, you might be wondering, how do I draw a Venn diagram for three sets or four sets? We'll talk about that in one second. Uh, but here, we are looking first at A intersection B. So if I take a look at A intersection B, that is this part right here. And now the second step of this is I want to, I want to take the union of that red part with, the, with A as well. So if I take the union of this red part with A, then it basically has this area. Now we can verify that this area is nothing more than A, so we verified this rule. So, uh, so what I would recommend is uh, take a look at some other ones of these laws and see if you can draw a diagram for the left-hand side and the right-hand side just to verify, at least to convince yourself that these laws are actually true. So um, go back and review the laws that we know from before, right? So the, the double negation, now it's called double complement. We have the Morgan's law, commutative law, associative law, distributive law. So all of these laws, we've actually seen uh, at least the, the structure, we've seen these laws before. So, uh, so what I want you to do is um, review them, make sure you know how to use them because the way that we can show that two sets are equal or two expressions, two, two set theory uh, expressions are equal to each other is exactly the same as propositional logic. All right, so, um, so the other thing I just very quickly wanted to mention is uh, if you remember why we had two columns for the laws of logic, right? It's the same reason why we have two laws for the laws of set operation. So here, um, if we wanted to find the dual, right, the dual law, we would switch the intersections with the unions, whoops, with the unions. Right, so anytime we see a union, make it an intersection and vice versa. And we would also switch the, in the past, it was the ands and uh, it was the, the uh, false and trues. In this case, we're going to swap the empty sets with the universes. So universes is the, is the, uh, is the thick U, is the, the bold U. Okay, so know that these laws have a dual aspect to them as well. All right. So, well, at this point, you might be asking, well, if the laws of set theory exist and uh, the, the, law, uh, the set theory is related to propositional logic in terms of the laws, what about the tables that we were using in propositional logic? And the answer is there are tables as well, except in set theory, the tables are a little bit different. We have to think of the tables in a slightly different way. They are called membership tables. They're not logical tables, but they're membership tables. And the zeros and ones are still there, but the zeros and ones represent something a little bit different. So in a membership table, a zero actually represents not in, and one represents in. So it it basically uh, illustrates whether an element is found or not found in a set. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take the, the simplest example of the, the tables that we've seen before, which is a table involving two sets. So I have a set A and a set D. Now at the time, I said this is a general Venn diagram for two sets, right? So wh why do we call this a general Venn diagram for two sets? Well, if we consider two sets, a and B, right? Where can an element be? Okay, any element in this universe with respect to set A and set B, where can they be? Well, they can be neither A nor B. They can be in, uh, not in A, but is in B. It can be in A, but not in B, but it, it can also be in both. Now notice that each one of these rows represents a separate area in the Venn diagram. So for example, zero, zero, is talking about an element that is not in A and also not in B, right? So remember zero represents not in. So it's not in A and not in B. So it's right there, it's somewhere outside of these two circles. Now, similarly, zero one, not in A, but is in B is talking about here. And one zero is in A, but not in B is here. And then finally, one one is talking about this area. So you can kind of visualize in your head that each one of these rows are representing a particular area that an element can be in with respect to A and B. 
And now we can see where those definitions of uh, unions and intersections come from. So let's take a look at them. We have intersection, we have union, uh, we have the symmetric difference, we have the set subtraction. Um, let's take a look at A complement as well. So for intersection, we said all those elements that are in A and in B. Well, the elements that are in A and in B is only talking about this one one. Now this output, this right hand side, what this table is telling you is in this operation, is this, uh, is this element in this set? So we have an element that is in A and in B. Is it in the intersection? Yes, it's in the intersection. Is it in, uh, if, I have a, if I have an element in A but not in B, is it in the intersection? The answer is no. This one, no. This one, no. Right. So if you take a look at what the table looks like, this looks a lot like our uh, looks like uh, a lot like our table for conjunction. And in fact, if you take a look at the the area that is one, imagine those to be shaded, then it looks a lot like our definition for the and. Right. So it looks a lot like the definition that we gave here. All right, so only one one, only the area one one is shaded. Okay, what about the union? What does a union look like? Well, union is that it if I have a area, uh, if I have an element outside of A and B, that's not in the union, but everything else is. All right, you see the one zero, the zero one, and the one one area is shaded, so they have the ones. All right, what about the uh, the, the symmetric difference, the, the exclusive or. We have one, uh, sorry, we have zero, one, one, and zero, right? So A or B, but not both. So zero, one, one, zero. Uh, what about this it, A minus B? So A minus B, uh, if you imagine the, the shading has one, zero shaded. So one, zero is shaded, but nothing else is shaded. So this is our definition for A minus B. And then finally, what about A complement? Well, A complement is the opposite of A. So what's the area that's outside of A? It's 0, 0. And it's also 0, 1. So those are the areas outside of A. And then those are not shaded. Which if you look closely, this is exactly the not, the negation of A. So A goes 0, 0, 1, 1. The complement of A goes 1, 1, 0, 0. Okay. So just keep in mind, once again, that uh, this membership table, what it tells us is uh, whether or not the, uh, the, the, the particular elements, if they're sitting in a particular location with respect to A and B, are part of the new set. All right. So now that we know about uh, set operations, and we know about membership tables. Let's very quickly just review what we know uh, about uh, uh, showing that two expressions are equal. Now, again, uh, we've been doing tabular proofs and algebraic proofs in propositional logic. So let's just very quickly do an example uh, just to make sure we, we can jog our memory a little bit uh, on how these proofs work. So the first thing we'll do is I'm going to start with an algebraic proof. Okay, so an algebraic proof, and I want to show that A union B intersects C union B complement. And if I complement this, if I complement everything, is equal to B intersects C. Okay, now let's refer back to the uh, to the laws of uh, set theory that we had before, and I'm just gonna. Uh, uh, make note that we can do a De Morgan's law on this uh, on this set. Now, uh, the way to read this is that you can kind of imagine that there's a bracket around here, right? So even, even though I didn't explicitly put it there because there is a line above uh, that statement, you can imagine that there is a bracket there. So I'm going to do a De Morgan's law. I'm going to put this uh, complement inside of the bracket, and I'm going to end up with something like this. So A union B intersects C, and then we have a double complement, U, B, double complement. So this was from the De Morgan's law. 
Now we have the double complement, so I can just get rid of those. So I have A union B intersect C intersect. Oh, sorry, this should be intersect because we put the uh, we put the the complement inside. So intersect B. Okay, so now. Remember earlier in propositional logic, I said we should probably look for a variable and then the opposite of that variable because that's usually how things cancel out. But here, I don't see that. But I do see uh, a situation where I can use absorption law. So I'm just going to move this over. So let, let me just label this. This was double negation or double complement. OK, so I'm going to move the B over like this, that was the associative law. So since we have and, and, I can switch the order of the ands. And now if I just take a look at this part, this is nothing more than B from the absorption law. So this is just really B intersects C from the absorption. Okay, so we've taken the uh, the forms of the algebra of the, the set theory uh, uh, laws, and then we apply and uh, we applied them one by one until we got to the conclusion. And now we can claim that these two sets are equal. So what equality means in set theory is that these two sets take up the same area on the Venn diagram. Okay, but I hope you already know how to do this. So the second example that I want to show you here is using a tabular proof. So using a table, can I show the same thing? And again, I'm just going to uh, run through this pretty quickly because I, I trust that everybody knows how to do this already. I'm going to uh, just do three variables here. So I'm going to have my eight cases, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. So I'm going to have my eight cases. I'll keep everything in line here. And I'm just going to start with the left hand side, I'm going to start with A union B intersect C. I'm going to skip a, a few steps here. And uh, A union B intersect C means that this is zero whenever C is zero. So when C is zero, I'm going to label this as zero, 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 and zero. It is also zero when both A and B are zero. So in this case, it is also zero, but in every other case, it would be true. It would be a one. OK, so I'm going to do one, uh, fill in the ones here. So, so I, I know I skipped a little bit of steps there, but uh, please check my work. But the result of this expression is 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and so on. So what you're seeing in this row here. I'm just going to label this number 1. And I'm going to take number 1 and complement it. So see what we're doing here. Take number 1 and complement it. And I'm going to take u, uh, the union with b complement. So one complement is like this, okay, the opposite of one. And then the complement of B looks like 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. And then if I take the union of the two, I'm going to get something like this. So this part, I'm going to label as number two. Okay, finally, I'm going to take two and I'm going to complement it. And this is going to be the result of the right-hand side. So two complement is going to give me 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And now I want to compare this to the right-hand side, which is B intersect C. Okay, So I want to compare that with what the outcome of B intersect C is. Uh, if I just take a look at what B intersect C is, it is 0, 0, 0, and 1. So both B and C are 1. And then I also have 0, 0, 0, 1. Both B and C are 1. So I see that these two match. So therefore, I can claim that they are equal. OK, so uh, I hope this has been just a review, right? Because I, I trust everyone has done work on algebra as well as the tabular method. So this is really not anything new, with the exception that this is with respect to, uh, to, to set theory. So we're, we're understanding this result with respect to sub, uh, with, sorry, with respect to uh, set theory. But I want to do one last example here, which is drawing Venn diagrams. Okay. So, uh, so let, let's do a new example. 
let's say I, I ask you the question, is A union B intersect C equal to B intersect C? Okay. Now, here, what we want to do is we want to use a Venn diagram in order to show this. So I want to be able to draw a diagram to be able to compare the right-hand side and left-hand side to see if they are equal. So in a Venn diagram, what we're looking at is what areas are covered, right? What, what, what coverage do we have of, uh, of the elements? So I'm going to start with the left-hand side here. Okay, so I know we haven't drawn any Venn diagrams that involve three sets, but here we go. You know that whenever we have three sets, we have eight different rows on our table. Each one of those areas on the, uh, uh, sorry, each one of the rows represent a different area in the Venn diagram. So we have to be careful that when we draw the Venn diagram that we actually see all eight areas. And the best way to draw this Venn diagram is something like this. We have A, we have B, and then C kind of crosses over with everything. So you can very quickly just verify that there are in fact eight different areas on this diagram, right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And now the next part is to uh, work out what the uh, what, what area is being shaded. So the first thing we'll do is I'm going to start with a yellow here. And we're going to shade in the part A union B. So where is A union B? Well, all the elements that are in A or in B is this area. Now we have to be careful here because it does get a little bit harder to see, but take a look at that area. That is A union B, right? So that is A or B. Now I'm going to take this yellow area and I'm going to intersect it with C. So what of this yellow area crosses over to C? And I'm just going to shade in the rest, okay? And this is the area that we're talking about. Okay, so we kind of imagine that that's the shaded area. Those are the elements that are represented on the right-hand side. But what about the left-hand side? Well, oh, sorry. What about the right-hand side? The right-hand side, I'm going to draw a similar diagram. Okay, so I'm going to draw an A, B, and C diagram, just like that. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to verify uh, whether they are equal or not. Now, you might be asking, well, wait a minute, the, the right-hand side expression doesn't actually have an A in there. So why is it that I need to put an A there? Well, the short answer is because we are comparing diagrams. So even though A doesn't appear on the right-hand side equation, we should still keep A in there because we want to verify whether the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. If A is missing, then there's no way to compare. Right? So the two diagrams have to have the same sets in there. So where is B intersect C? Well, the elements that are in B and in C, I hope you agree, is right here. Okay, so those are the elements in B and in C. So are they equal? Well, I hope you can see, no, they're not. They're not equal, right? Because they are representing different areas in the Venn diagram. So what is different? Well, in this diagram, there's one part that is shaded. And in this diagram, in the, the right-hand side diagram, there's a part that's not shaded. So what area is this? So if I, if I was looking at the table ABC, right? So this area ABC, there is going to be one which differs, right? So that one is in A, in C, but not in B, right? In A, not in B, and is in C. So in A, not in B, and is in C, for this diagram, it is shaded, but for this diagram, it is unshaded. So we can imagine that if we were to draw a table for the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we would see a difference in that row. We would see a difference in the row 101. Now, this, this whole uh, example, uh, I hope, has shown you some of the, 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 uh, the characteristics of a Venn diagram. So if you remember why we used algebra to begin with, right? So why do, why do we use algebra? Well, we can use algebra to simplify expressions. That's what, good, uh, that's what algebra is good for. So if I want to show that two things are equal to each other, I can use algebra by simplifying one to the other. That's what algebra is for. For a table, 
what, what's good is that I can figure out whether or not two things are actually equal. So if I draw the table and I find that all of the rows match, then I can conclude that those two things are equal. Those two expressions are equal. Now the Venn diagram gives us the same advantages. Okay, so drawing a table and drawing the Venn diagram is exactly the same. There is no difference between, uh, between those two things. So you get the same benefits, the same advantage of uh, the table with the Venn diagram. And in fact, the Venn diagram is a lot simpler, right? It's a lot simpler to draw. We don't have to draw a bunch of zeros and ones. So, uh, so on an exam, I will uh, oftentimes simplify the question by giving you a Venn diagram and saying, you know, what areas are shaded, right? So, so practice drawing the Venn diagrams and practice, you know, seeing or, you know, uh, being able to represent the result. Okay, so before we end off this video, uh, I want to introduce one last concept, which is kind of like notation that we're going to use for later on in the course. Uh, there is this notation, which is a generalized set operation. So a generalized set operation uh, is kind of like summation. If you remember the summation notation, we had uh, the, the big E, and then we had uh, you know, some rules pertaining to that summation, and we had a bunch of terms. So here we have the exact same thing. So for example, uh, we have what's called an index set. Let's call it I. It doesn't have to be I, it could be any, any variable. Let's say I has the numbers two, four, six, eight, right? Just, just as an example. Then we can represent the union of i, small i, in big I. So for every element in i, in the big I, I can represent a i. And essentially what this means is take every element that's in i and then just plug it into the expression that's in here and then take the union of all of these things. Okay, so let's imagine that AI represents a set. Okay, so in this case, we would say that this is A2. So two goes into I, four goes into I, six goes into I, and eight goes into I. So this is just short notation for something like this. Now, of course, the intersection also has a generalized set operation, which looks exactly the same, but uh, but other notations that we're going to use, at least for our course, is that we can also use something like this. So the union of i equals 1 up to n. We can also do something like that of a i. And this is going to be a 1 union a 2 union a 3 all the way up to whatever n is. So just know that whenever you see this notation, this is what it represents. It represents a generalized set operation on many sets. So with this in mind, we can now define a general de Morgan's law. Okay, so this is a general de Morgan's law. Now, if you remember de Morgan's law, it means that whenever we have a complement, I can distribute the complement inside of the bracket, but uh, into the individual sets. But then the or operation, the union operation, has to change into an intersect operation. So uh, see if you understand what I mean by this. If I take the union, the, the generalized union, from 1 up to n of ai, so imagine what this looks like. This looks like the kind of the right-hand side here. And if I take a complement of the whole thing, so imagine I draw a big line across this whole thing, okay? This is equal to the individual intersections from one up to n of a i individual complement, right? So imagine what's gonna happen if I distribute this uh, complement into the individual a's, I will have to turn all of these unions into intersections. Okay, so this is a general de Morgan's law for the union. There's also a dual of this law, which is the intersection of one up to n of a i complement is equal to the union of one up to n of a i complement. Now, if you take a look at this law, 
I don't know if you are convinced that this law is actually true, right? So for example, an application of this law would be like if I have A1 union A2 union A3 union A4, if I take the complement, this is equal to A1, sorry, A1, intersect A2, intersect A3, intersect A4, right? Is this actually true? Well, we know for two sets, this is true, right? So if I have A1 in, uh, union A2 and I take the complement, I know I can distribute that. But for four sets or five sets or eight sets, is it still true? Is this law still true? Now, when I introduced the Morgan's law at, uh, when we were talking about propositional logic, I said, this is true. You just have to believe me for now. But what I, what I want to do in the next section, in the next topic, not, not right now, but in the next topic, is I actually want to prove the Morgan's Law to be true. Okay, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but for now, I just want to write the general de Morgan's Law as a, uh, as a denotation. Okay, and later we'll come back and we'll actually prove this law. All right, so I'll see you in the next video.